Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. I'm joined today by Jeff Thompson and he will be talking to you about test process improvement, how hard can it be? And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Jeff about his presentation, just type them there into the questions field on your control panel and at the end of the webinar we will go through as many of these questions as we can within the hour. And don't, don't forget that you can type these questions at any point during the course of the webinar, so you, you don't have to wait necessarily till the very end. So, now let me hand you over to today's presenter, Jeff Thompson. Hello, Jeff. Hi, Dara. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm trusting everyone can see my screen. Um, we can so, indeed, uh, yes. You can indeed. Good. Lovely. It's all the technology's working. So uh, firstly, uh, uh, welcome to this webinar. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about test process improvement, as the title says, and look at some of the, uh, the reasons that test process improvement fails to hopefully help us successfully do pre test process improvement going forward. Um, there is a deliberate mistake on this front screen, so if the first person to, to log it uh, wins my, my eternal gratitude. Um, I'll put a picture of myself on the front page, so at least if you walk past me in the street, you'll know who I am. So normally when I present this, this session, I do tend to ask people who has been involved in test process improvement in the past, who has experience of test process improvement, and obviously I can't do that today, so I'm going to make an assumption that some of you have and some of you haven't. Hopefully, on that, uh, well, when I do these in, uh, in public places, uh, the vast majority of people have not done process improvement and are here to learn. Uh, those who have done it may have some additional questions which can always help enhance my presentation, so please feel free to ask. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about how we got to where we are today, it's how do we get to where we are as an industry, testing. Uh, I want to define what I mean by test process so that we're all very clear what I'm talking about. Uh, and then we're going to look at some reasons why process change fails, which will lead us nicely on to those challenges, uh, the people and culture challenge, the communications challenge, and the processes that live around testing in the software development life cycle. And finally, uh, I want to talk about the fact that we've come a long way, and actually, you know, we have done some really good stuff in this time. And I'm going to share with you some results of a, of a recent survey that my company undertook to actually uh, show you how well we are doing as an industry. So, as a brief introduction to me, my name is, as, as Dara said, is Jeff Thompson. I'm the consultancy director of a consultancy company called Experimentus. Uh, we are the number one TMMI assessment company in the world, so we travel the world assessing people's test process and helping them understand how to fix it if there are any issues with it. Uh, or, and certifying people who achieve levels of maturity. For those who don't know TMMI, TMMI is very similar to CMI, it's a five-stage model. We will refer to that later on in the program so that you can get some understanding of where we're coming from. So a lot of what I'm about to talk to you has come from real experience uh, in, over the last 12 years, helping many companies around the world improving their processes. Okay, so how do we get here? Uh, IT itself is a relatively new industry in the scheme of things. You know, manufacturing industry, electrical manufacturing, all those things have been around for a long, lot longer than IT. Um, you know, I started my working life in, 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 the, in the late 70s, and IT was only just really starting to appear on the horizon. In fact, I remember two years after I joined the excitement of having one VDU in the room and having to queue up to use it for three minutes a day, um, and how excited I was that we had IT for the first time. Um, testing itself didn't really come into its own until the early 90s, so again, it's 20 years later and before testing actually really got a foothold and began to be seen as a, as a, as a almost a, an independent function within the software development, development life cycle. Now way back when, and we're talk, I'm talking now about people who are probably in management roles, uh, a lot of us fell into the role of testing. Now, there was no defined job, so, uh, but we all needed to make sure the software worked. I came into testing because I ran a department of people processing business and we were forever having problems with the system failing. So I complained a lot and I was asked to therefore step into the role of trying to make sure it worked. A lot of people the same. The good news today, and again I can't ask the question because we're on a WebEx, but a lot of people today come into testing from the beginning. That's their career choice, which I think is excellent. Um, with a, uh, and there are, uh, there are now certifications out there that can help us to learn our job properly, which 20 years ago, 20 or even 30 years ago, didn't exist. 
But we're still very much a craft. We're not a profession. And what do I mean by that? I mean that a craft is a hand-me-down process. So we learn from the people we work with. We don't necessarily learn from a central coordinated uh, a TBOC, a, 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 a testing book of knowledge. Uh, we do have certification, but it's very uh, low key at the moment. It's quite, it's, it's good certification. I'm not challenging the certification. I think they're, they're worthwhile, but it doesn't actually drive us to be a profession at the moment. You know, we're not yet fully established in the university curriculum, although a lot of work is being done to do that. You know, so we're moving towards a profession, but we're still very much craft. A lot of us learn our skill set from the people we, and and they learn from their person they sat next to. There's no real central pot. So we are doing okay. We have got here without, uh, we, we fought very well to be where we are today. So that gives us a view of how we got to where we are today. So yeah, we've kind of, a lot of people fell into this. It wasn't their chosen role um, and, uh, and we're still very much a craft. So we're moving forward. But the key thing with any, any role we do uh, in IT is that you know a level of process needs to exist to help us to do the job properly so that we can repeat what we do. We can do the same job as the person next to us, therefore you know, move around, reuse, all that kind of thing. So what, what is a process? Let's have a look at what a process is. So um, it, from the purposes of this presentation, I'm using a definition from process engineering effectively. Nothing to do with testing, but pure process engineering. And in pure process engineering, there are four levels of process. Level zero, which is linking process to process. So it's looking where there's direct interaction between one process and another. And it's very high level. It's not every process, it's the key process. Level one is the definition of the sub-processes within the process we're looking at. So in this instance, it would be the testing sub-processes. Level two is a high level activity diagram, often looking a bit like a snake. And we'll look at all of these uh, together in, in a minute, so I'll explain them a lot more in the next few slides. And level three is the swim lane that we all, uh, I guess, are getting used to in this world today that define detailed steps that link back to level two, one, and zero. So if we look at them one at a time, we can, I can hopefully help you understand those if, so we're all on the same page. So this is what I call a, a high level integration diagram. So in the center is the process we're working on. In this particular instance, we defined it as validation and testing. Around the outside are the direct interactions that exist to other areas that were perceived to be the most important um, in this particular scenario. So we have system design, development, business analysis, test environment management, design authorities, defect management, and configuration management. Now interestingly in this situation, uh, whoever drew this diagram uh, perceives that defect management was only an input, not an output, whereas everything else is bi-directional. But it's, a, it's an image, it's, it's the start of a process, the embryonic view of where the process sits in the process hierarchy. That's a level zero process. A uh, level two process is in fact, in this instance, uh, a level one and a level two process. So interestingly, uh, when I said earlier on that a level one process was a sub-process definition, hopefully you can all see the screen, and just below where it says validation and testing level two high level design, you'll see four boxes, VT1, test planning, VT2, test specification, VT3, test execution, and VT4, test closure. Those four items are in fact level one definition, so it's the key air, uh, process silos, for want of a better word, within your process. For the purposes of this diagram, I didn't include level two because we'd repeat it again here. So this is effective level one and level two. So now we look at level two and we see what I, when I said earlier on that level two is a snake, you can see this process snakes its way through the boxes and it defines at a high level the high level tasks. So for example, in this particular scenario, the three high level tasks in test planning were performing a product risk assessment, were uh, revising or creating a test estimate and developing the test plan. Now all of these are owned by the test manager, hence the name test manager is defined underneath. In fact, every task on here was defined as being owned by the test manager ensuring it compliance to it was owned by the test manager. When the test planning is complete, we move into test specification where you have some more uh, activities. Final, uh, then test execution, which is a circular process. Obviously, as you find defects, you move around again, and you finally come out to closure. So this is a level two process area. Now the level three process area is probably the ones that we as users of Test of a test process are probably more familiar with, which is the swim lane design. 
So the good thing about a swim lane design is it, it not only shows you the task, but it also shows the responsible role. So in this instance, we have two responsible roles. This is the second task. If I go back, it's the second task under VT1 test planning. Therefore, it is defined as task VT1.2, and is revised update test estimates. So this task starts with the test manager who completes a test estimate. They then seek approval, which then goes through to the project manager to review if he approves it, it comes out of the process and goes into the next step, VT1.3. If he uh, refuses it, it comes back through a cycle of review. So these are the core components of a process uh, as far as uh, this presentation is concerned. So when I'm referring to process, these are what, this is exactly what I'm referring to. And in, in our world today, uh, what tends to happen is this kind of diagram and this kind of diagram get mixed. So we kind of mix the size and scale. So you have some detail, you have some not some high level detail, some low level detail. So this, using this approach helps you to split the two things apart. So it's a very clear demarcation between the high level process and the detail. And in process engineering, you don't need to do level three process areas where it doesn't need to be explained. So if there's any one of these boxes on this process level two process area that don't need any further explanation, you don't need to develop one of these, so you don't have to have these for everything. You do obviously need a level zero, one, and two, regardless. So that's a process. So this is what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to define this process and, and get it implemented. So why does process change fail? The subject to my presentation. So let's go through eight key areas which create reasons why process change may fail for organizations. So process change fails because there's no sense of urgency. I, I presented at a conference about three years ago where I was talking about process improvement and this gentleman put his hand up and said, I've been doing it for 15 years. And I asked him what that meant and he said, oh, every day I change something. And I said, so what's the urgency? What, why is it taking 15 years? Well, nobody cares about it really. Ah, so why do you do it? Do you get credit for it? I don't get any credit for it either. Hmm. So there's no desire to do change. There's no sense of urgency. Um, the other, one of the other problems is the no guiding teams. This is kind of where you set off on your own. So a lot of process change is driven from below to go up. And um, in, in principle then what happens is uh, if that's done and driven purely by the lower end, of the, 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 the people on the shop floor, there's no commitment from above, there's no management commitment, there's no sponsor, there's no senior management authority to do the work. So it has no commitment and no guide, which leads nicely onto the fact that the next thing that we often see missing is no change or vision strategy. So there's change going on, but nobody quite knows why. I mean, everybody can suggest that things could be improved, but unless there's a benefit to that improvement and an objective and a strategy, then there isn't any point in doing it. It won't be recognized as a change, and it might be just one or two people that will adopt it. So you need to define a change, vision, and strategy. So, so far, we've talked about lots of things. And, and, and not one of them has been to do with process at the moment. And this is the key thing, I think, in that a lot of people leap straight into writing process without thinking about the setup time. So a, a process change project is exactly the same as a software project. You need to put the timing up front to understand the scope, scale, etc. So moving down the list, item number four, no communication or understanding and buy-in. Yeah, if if you ju when I first joined IT 20 odd years ago, uh, a process change was communicated by somebody turning up in the morning and taking my old manual away and putting a new manual, manual on my desk. Um, no entertainment, no, no, weren't entertaining any training or any understanding for me to actually understand what the changes were, why I've got this new book turn up, it's the first I knew about it, and nine times out of ten I ignored it, as did everybody who sat with me. So you need to get this level of understanding. You need to get people to think they're part of the process. So some time and effort needs to be put into communicating. And then another area is where nobody's empowered to act. What do I mean by that? I mean that actually it's kind of almost uh, the, the task of changing a process is given, but it's not as important as everything else you're doing. So, you know, it, uh, and often when you try and do it, somebody challenges you and tells you you shouldn't be doing it. So you haven't been given any level of responsibility, it just exists. Next challenge, no short-term wins. So I know when I've done process change, how infuriated I've got, there is, I need quick wins, I need quick wins. Now, the attention span of anybody sponsoring a process project is quite limited because actually, they, most of the people who sponsor these things exist to get real product to market to make revenue for their organizations. So we often find that um, 
people don't not doing short-term wins, their project peters out because people lose interest. They don't, they, they've lost track that it's happening. So short-term wins is really important. Those wins can be as simple as a piece of communication and as more complicated as delivery of a new piece of process. But in principle, you need to keep driving very quick short-term wins, periodically, maybe once a month, maybe once every so often. Um, and, uh, yeah. and then moving on, uh, we go back to no sense of urgency. One of the key issues with no sense of urgency is there's no, then there, then there's no pressure to deliver. Uh, my first ever big process project many, many years ago, um, I fought with my manager to, uh, to push me to deliver, to give me targets, because actually without targets, without pressure, enthusiasm in the team draw, dries up. So actually you need to keep the pressure on. And then... Um, the key and one of the most important things to, to, to remember is that no one understood the need to change the culture. I'll say it here and I'll say it again as I go through. The changing of the process can account for between 10 and 25% of the, the effort. The biggest effort in any change program is changing the culture, moving the people from one place to another. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So obviously we've now talked about why they change. So without a surprise, if we reverse those, we get successful change. Now, at this point, I'll credit my friend, Mr. John Cotter. I say he's my friend, I've never met the man, but I feel I could get on very well with him. He, he, uh, he's a, a, very, um, a very prolific writer, has written many, many books, quite big, thick books around uh, changing and change culture. And um, has, I'll talk a bit more about this later on this book, but has developed a book called Our Iceberg is Melting, which I'll talk again about later on. And in there, he actually picks up on these same eight items, but turns them the other way around as, as the reasons why change can be successful. So the first stage is you need to set the stage, which is creating that sense of ur urgency. Um, yeah, I was lucky. My first ever process change was driven by a major system outage that was actually nothing to do with testing, but testing was blamed and therefore gave the incentive to invest the money to try and polish the process. So you need a sense of urgency. Something needs to drive the need to change. You need to pull together your guiding team, your stakeholders, your sponsors, as well as the people to do the work. Yeah, You can't just do it with the people to do it. You need your stakeholders, sponsors, people who are going to invest time in you. Yeah, Invest time in you. Then you need to decide what to do. You need to look. You need to develop your change of vision strategy. You need to understand uh, your current position, your baseline. Where are you today? What is it you're trying to change? You need to define your objectives. What is the goal? Those objectives would, in any uh, theoretical uh, discussion, would be defined by the uh, change strategy by the organisation, or may actually be defined by a quality strategy. Um, or a quality policy. But if you haven't got any of those, you need to define them in, in the project so you know the start and the end of what you're doing. Then you need to make it happen. And, and part of this, and as you can see, none of this is about the work you do to physically change the, the process. It's about now we're starting about communicating. So it's about building that communication network, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Empowering others to act, making it possible for people to enforce the change. Yeah? One of the challenges you always get when you implement change from project managers is this will cost you more. So what does somebody do? Okay, fine, I'll walk away. No, you need them to be empowered to do whatever's necessary to help that project adopt the change. You need to produce these short-term wins. Things that would encourage people to uh, take on the process. So. Uh, I remember years ago, I, I was working with a, a very, very large bank who were doing a process change, and they, they implemented for one of their short-term wins was what I call the Ghostbuster attack. Uh, I've, I know some people may have heard me speak of this before, so I apologize for any on the call that have heard it before, but in principle, um, way back when, not now, we all know Ghostbusters is coming out uh, very soon, an updated version, but when Ghostbusters was first launched all those years ago, uh, what we saw, certainly in the UK, was on bus stop banners around the country, pictures of cartoon ghosts, nothing else, just a cartoon ghost, and different cartoon ghosts every few weeks. And in the end, the whole country is saying, what is this, what is this, what is this? As soon as they announced that it was a film and it was called Ghostbusters, we all wanted to go and see it. We must see that. You know, it was in our psyche by that point that we all had to go and see it. And this organization, this bank, did exactly the same thing. In the, leading up to the launch of their first change, they produced and distributed pictures of bugs. They put them all around their building. No explanation, and they changed them regularly so that people saw different things every day. Everybody got it. Everybody wanted to be connected to it. Very interesting. There was a great presentation at, at um, Eurostar a few years ago, Go uh, testing on the toilet from Google. Uh, uh, not, not a delightful 
possible subject to raise on a webinar, but you know, when we all go to the toilet, if we're gentlemen, we tend to look at the wall, if we're ladies, we tend to look at the back of the door. So Google took the opportunity to put banners up in front of the men and on the back of the doors for the ladies, so that they were, and put messages on there to help people understand when change was happening. So there's lots of things you can do that aren't just delivering process. Communication is a very key short-term win. But don't let up, keep the pressure on, you know, keep the enthusiasm going. Hopefully from a senior, if you've put the right guiding team together, they'll keep driving you. Here's your delivery date, keep delivering, keep delivering. And make it stick, most importantly, create a new culture, get that culture sorted. So we're now going to have a quick look at change and vision strategy, and we're going to have a quick look about communication and understanding and buy-in. There's two specific areas that I feel quite strongly about uh, are, are perhaps one of the main issues why things don't work. We'll also touch on the new culture as we go through this. So if we look at change and vision strategy, uh, cha uh, sorry, change plan, vision and strategy, we need to think about how this is all going to happen. How are we actually going to make this change? So what I have here is something that we use as experimenters when we do change for people and we look at the stuff that needs to exist. Now there's no size and scale mentioned here. Some of these activities are bigger, some are smaller. But what it's showing you is, 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 is a process by way, or is an approach by way we can get to grips with how we do change. So the first thing we need to do is initiate and set up if we go back to our eight, eight successes. We need some structure, we need the people. We need to understand how we're going to govern and report this. How are we going to tell people about success, etc., etc.? We need to put a charter together and some terms of reference. And we need to plan and have a business case. They all need to exist in that first stage of initiation. Having successfully gone through initiation, uh, and some of the, uh, none of these work, uh, this is, these could be run in parallel. It, it, they don't have to be run as separate flowing tasks, but uh, we then need to create a baseline. So where are we today? Where is our process today? How good is our process today? What is it we're then going to change? Identifying the gap. What are you going to use as your model? What is the thing you use to measure your process against? I've mentioned TMI and I will push TMI as one of the better and more independent measures of a good test process that exists in the world today. So you can go and have a look at TMI.org. But actually, that could be a way to measure. That says where you are. You can then look and say, right, what are the changes I need to make? What is the gap between where I want to be and where I am? And from there, you can develop your implementation approach. How are you going to do it? You update your plans. You can update your business case because you'll have more detail. Next stage, traditional phase of any project. We need to develop and test. So we need to develop the processes or create them or update them. We need to develop the measurement mechanism we're going to use for this new world, the KPIs, what are the measurements we're going to have to measure not only the use of the process but the success of the process. We need to establish what changes are necessary for HR. I'm sure those who've done process change will realise very quickly that when you start changing process you start to play around with people's levels and people's jobs. You start to yeah, some of the authority levels move around. So you need to make sure you cover off HR and finally and most importantly what tools can help you, not just to automate tests, but you know, for other things that exist, anything else that's going on to provide your KPIs, what tools exist that can drive your KPIs uh, out around your organisation without you having to sit there creating spreadsheets, for example. Now, any, one, one of the challenges of doing process change is that you can um, review documents with processes in forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and never quite get to links. You can always find something you want to change. To me, one cycle of review, update, straight into pilot. And the point of pilot is that's the only time you really see if you've developed a process that works, trying it for real. Now, you, the first thing you do in a pilot is select your pilot project, and you need to define what the criteria is for that selection. Uh, it may be something like low-risk project, something that's got a full end-to-end -end cycle of less than three months because you don't want to be piloting for two years. Um, it should, you, you just build up a set of criteria that you use. You then use that criteria to select your pilot project. You then train that pilot and you monitor that pilot through its delivery, learning as you go, updating the process as it needs to be updated. And then finally, we look at um, deployment. And deployment's all about getting it out there and getting it used. So we look at things like identifying test change champions. Now this won't be done at the end. We will probably do this as part of initiation and part of the baseline. Identify the people who will own this on the shop floor in the different teams. And one, of my, one of my last projects uh, was to actually deliver to over 400 testers spread across every, almost every continent in the world. So we needed to find people in those areas that could own it for us. 
develop a deployment plan. What projects are going to get what and when so everybody knows what's coming. Develop training materials. How are they going to learn? And put together the benefit measurement. Yeah, identify what it is that you're going to measure to enable the benefit realization to occur. Running alongside all of these, change management, stakeholder management. And, and one quick mention of change management. I, I just got so, I get so excited these days when I read, uh, and that's very sad, I have to say, um, but when I see that the role of change director is now starting to come into its own. So people are being brought into companies at board level to make change happen, which has only got to be a good thing. Okay. So we've done the change of vision. We had to think about the people. What a lovely bunch of people these are. They must be developers. They're all looking scruffy. I don't see testers ever looking quite that scruffy. Ha <laughs> ha. People are an important part of this process change. As I said to you, 20% of the work we just talked about, that was 20% of the work. The rest of it is changing these people to work in a different way. People are interesting. We learn process, we then use process. Uh, and I'd, I'd use, as, as, as an example here, driving a car. I have two lovely daughters uh, who've been driving for about 10 years. Uh, and I know that if I went up to them tomorrow and said, tomorrow you're gonna, your car steering wheel is going to move from one side of the car to the other, and you're going to drive on the other side of the car, they would immediately panic. Whereas up to date, they've been very comfortable with driving their car as they are. So changing people's way of working is actually quite a hard thing. As a human race, we adopt, we, we learn things we, by just copying them. We then adapt those and adopt those things mentally so that we don't think about them anymore. You know, driving is a good example of half the time when you're driving, you don't think about changing gear, you just do it. When you first learn to drive, you're listening for that engine to change tone so that you can change gear. Once you're driving, you don't. It becomes a natural byproduct of doing the drive. And it's the same when you go to work in the office. You do the same thing day in, day out. You don't think about it. If I came in tomorrow and said, you're going to change, oh. a friend of mine lost his job by doing this, uh, actually doing this. What he said to his team, he pulled them into a room one morning. They were working really, really well. And he said, right, I'm going to try an experiment. I'd like you to all change your jobs so that tomorrow, today you do somebody else's job. And he had uproar uproar to the point that the testing team almost crumbled, which ultimately, he was a contractor, meant he lost his job. Wasn't what he hoped for, but he learned a big lesson. So people are, are, are interesting to, to change. Uh, and as, as human beings, uh, and as IT people, we implement change on people all the time, but actually when people try and implement change on us, we're not quite so comfortable. So let's look at this. This is something called the Gartner Hype Cycle, which um, I like to use in these situations to show people what we do as human beings. So on, on, on the far left of the screen, you see the change trigger and the old status quo. So we have the old status quo, and we're not talking about rocking all over the world here. We're talking about where we are today. So today we're working normally. We're all very happy people sitting in office doing our job. We call that the status quo. We're not thinking about changing. Dum -dum. Something happens to trigger a change. Who knows what it is, a major disaster, the appointment of a change director, whatever it is. And then there's a bit of hype starts to happen where we actually start to really enthuse people about the change. Um, and that hype keeps going. And as human beings, what we do is accept that hype and think this is brilliant. The world's going to get better. It's going to be exciting. What we never think at that point is this is going to impact us. As individuals, we're going to have to change. So this is where we get to the peak of inflated expectations. So we all believe the world's suddenly going to change, but actually I'm not going to be affected. And somebody tells us that we're going to change. We have to change. So we start to drop down off of that peak of inflated expectations down towards the trough, the trough of disillusionment. Now, the danger here is that we don't recognize people slipping from the peak of inflated expectations into the trough of disillusionment. And then what happens is ultimately the process dies. So there's another line missing from here that carries straight down off the page with the letters RIP on the end of it. That's the end of your project. So the most important time in your project for monitoring the people is just after they've had to change after they've hit that peak of inflated expectations, they're now coming into work and have to think about what they do again. It's taking them longer. They're not happy. Oh, to help them pull through the trough of disillusionment. Now, in principle, and as Gartner have proven, if you can get through that trough of disillusionment, you hit the slope of enlightenment and you start to you adopt and adapt your process to the new process. So mentally, you throw away what you used to know and you've now absorbed and adopted what you know today. And then eventually that plateaus to the plateau of productivity, which is higher, productivity is higher than the old status quo. Otherwise, there would be no point in doing the change in the first place. So there's the cycle we all go through as human beings, some more than others.
but fundamentally, if you look at any change program, this is what happens. So change starts to happen at the peak of inflated expectations. And then what happens is people hit what, what the, psych the psychiatrists call a, an area of chaos, and that's where they have the old process battling with the new process in their heads. They know how they used to do it, they've got to try and remember how they've now got to do it, and there's, a, there's chaos happens. Captain Chaos, now panic, Captain Chaos is in town. Well, actually, for a change manager, chaos is beautiful. Chaos shows that they're learning, there's learning going on. If there's no chaos, maybe they're not adopting the process, maybe they're not even thinking about it, maybe they're ignoring it. Chaos gives you an indication that there is actually something happening and people are starting to change. People have to go through chaos mentally and it may be completely invisible to you. You may not look like the man on the left while this is going on. Some people do, I'm assuming, but actually uh, you, you may not. But in principle, chaos is beautiful. There is always challenge during this change period and that challenge means people are starting to try and understand. They're giving it their all to try and understand what's going on. So chaos is good. The challenge we have is that our uh, our sponsors, our stakeholders, occasionally believe that once you've written the process, the job is finished. Now, if you do that and chaos happens, so you've closed your project, you've all moved off, nobody's there to manage chaos. Unmanaged chaos will kill your project. It can be a very negative thing. Managed chaos is beautiful. It's actually change happening. So the key message is, you know, you, you, projects, ch uh, process change projects don't finish as soon as you've delivered the, the process change. They carry on afterwards. Okay, less people maybe, uh, maybe not full time, but they're there and you're forever monitoring. And what you're trying to do is move to an order, get order back into people's lives again, realign their thinking, realign their conceptual view of, of what they do on a daily basis and not head off down the, the negative chaos uh, which ends up in a, a very dark place. So what, what makes us, what drives some of this chaos and what drives some of the change in people? Well, uh, there's an effect I've, I've picked up, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still not sure this isn't a joke, but I think there's some interesting things in this that make me think, I, I've seen this in people. So it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect and it, it was written in 1999 by a guy called Justin Kruger and David Dunning, uh, both at Cornwall University. And it, it, in principle, it, it, it reflects on the, the famous Donald Rumsfeld statement of the unknown unknowns. So in principle, the unskilled suffer from illusionary superiority, rating their own ability as above average and much, but certainly much higher than it really genuinely is. Whilst the highly skilled underrate their abilities and they suffer from what we define as illusionary inferiority. So what you'll find in a meeting is those with, who, who don't know they're wrong will be shouting to get themselves heard. While those that know they're wrong will just sit quiet in the corner with a smug corner on their face, a lot of the smug smile on their face, they won't. So you, you see a very, two very different types of people. So that's the effect, let's, uh, that's how that, see how that's reflected when you're actually in operation. So uh, somebody with a Dunning-Kruger effect will overestimate their own level of skills. So they'll, they'll believe they know how to do testing and they don't accept somebody else knows better than them. I'd be, uh, which leads them this, this to the next stage, which is they fail to recognise genuine skills in others. So you know, a lot of these people who have overestimated their own skill set actually um, have told their bosses they're also brilliant. So they're also so they're not willing to accept somebody else who genuinely knows what the right way to work is. But because of that general lack of understanding, they don't recognise how inadequate they really, really are. And they only genuinely recognise that inadequacy when it's explained to them or they're, they're trained and they understand and then they say, yeah, the light comes on. But you know, there is utter confidence in those who with no expertise remain stubborn in their, in their views. Overwhelming evidence and an interesting scenario that I guess uh, we all suffer from. Now I'm by no means suggesting either of the two gentlemen I'm about to speak about are um, ignorant or a low level of skill set. but this, this Dunning-Kruger effect changes over time as you learn things. So, for example, when I first went to my first ever testing conference in 1997, I saw a gentleman called Tom Gilb, Tom Gilb stand on stage and tell me that inspections are the best thing to help you do a good process, to help you have a good project. Without inspections, projects fail. Inspections are the most important thing in a testing life cycle. And then five years ago, at the same conference, another year obviously, he stood up and said, I was wrong. I've now learned that inspections are not the right answer. There's other things we need to do as well. So he learned over time. So back in 1997, 
he was suffering from the ability of, he didn't know that he was wrong. James Back, who, a great guy, who uh, came out is the only encompassing process uh, technique you'll ever need to use for testing. Uh, he now says uh, exploratory testing is one of the techniques you need to use in software testing. So again, people learn. You can see this. I'm not suggesting they're wrong. These people don't know they're wrong, and none of us would recognize necessarily our own ability not to do this. So yeah, it's a couple of examples in our own industry there. So basically, those with the least, those with the least knowledge and the lowest level of skill tend to be the loudest and most confident. And that's no disrespect to the two gentlemen I've just talked about. I'm not labeling them like that. So let's give you an example. So this is, this is Fred. He, he, um, he's a, a robber. And uh, he's got this plan to rob a bank in Pittsburgh in the US. Now, uh, this is supposed to be a true story. It's not supposed to be a, 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 an urban myth. So you can tell he's a robber because he's got a gun and he's got a big hat on. Now, he, not, he usually wears a mask over his face. But he'd heard from a friend that if he covered his face in lemon juice, Nobody in the bank would recognize him, which is very interesting. So he did this experiment at home, and he cut a lemon in half, he covered his face in it, he got out his Polaroid camera, took a photograph, and he wasn't in it. So he believed it worked. So he headed off to the bank and um, robbed it, and therefore he had all his dollars in his hand, and went back to his, uh, his apartment, and he's busy counting his money, and 10 minutes later, the police knock on the door and say, excuse me, we're arresting you for robbing the bank. He said, no, I didn't. How do you know it was me? Well, you're very visible on the cameras. No, you're not. No, 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 I was invisible, I was invisible. So they took this guy to the, the um, uh, police station and showed him the video, and very clearly he was there, complete full frontal face. He couldn't understand until somebody showed him what he'd done. So he took his photographs with a Polaroid camera whilst he'd poured lemon juice into his eyes. Now, I don't know if you've ever poured lemon juice into your eyes, but you can't see very well afterwards. So he hadn't actually taken the cap off the camera. So what he got were very blank Polaroids, which he believed to mean to say that he didn't exist. Um, it wasn't until he saw the video that he truly believed that this trick that he'd been taught worked. So very interesting, Dunning-Kruger effect, Dunning-Kruger effect. Anyway, moving on, people, people, people. So um, we have we now move from people to teams for the moment. So we have two teams, um, two types of teams in many organizations. We have the organized team who follow a strict process today. And we have the disorganized team who might follow a process, but there's probably lots of them. So which one of those is better at change? Well, the interesting thing is it's actually the people without process because they're desperate. It's the people on the right-hand side. They're desperate. The people on the left-hand side, uh, the organized people, they find it very hard to change. So they don't accept change very easily. And, and if left alone, they will build a hybrid that's probably worse, more expensive, more costly, more time-consuming process than you've ever got. So you need to focus on both, but you need to put more focus on your teams that need the process least in their minds, because they're the ones that will use it least. So you need to focus on those, but don't forget the people that desperately need the process. So you're going to be monitoring the people that need the process. You're going to be asking them questions. They're going to be giving you on. You know, you're going to they're going to ask you how to do things. The other team, the team, the organized team, you're going to need to monitor, you're going to need to check, you're going to need to look at what they do. But moreover, in any process change, you need to be conscious of the one dissenter. The one dissenter is the man that will come along and kill your project. Um, I played this picture last year at Eurostar, and I don't think many people know what it is, but hopefully with the Dad's Army movie working around the world, you'll all know that it's Corporal Fraser from um, Dad's Army, who anything ever happened, he would suggest they were all doomed doomed, doomed, which is what you don't want in a process. Happened to me once, a guy who worked for me for many years, a very good friend, took aversion to the process change that we were, we were implementing and made his way to the board and uh, presented the board without our knowledge that the whole thing was a waste of money. And it took us three months to re-establish our position in the organization. So, you know, that one person can make a big difference. Salesmen will tell you when you're trying to sell product, you Focus on the one to say, you don't lose focus on everybody else, but you put more effort into the one person who's saying no. Because if you can turn that person, everybody else thinks, well, if they like it, it must be good. So yeah, keep your focus on the dissenter. So I said I'll come back to this, and very quickly I want to, because this is interesting, because what this book does is help you understand that not everybody will make the change journey. So not all the people you want to migrate will actually migrate. So John Cotter, great guy, talks about change a lot, very big books, had a real problem, didn't know how to get that message across in a quick and easy way. So he developed this little short story about a family of penguins 
uh, living on an iceberg who uh, suddenly found out their home was melting and therefore they had to change, they had to move. And there are lots of characters and it's a, uh, to be, if you go into uh, YouTube, uh, there's, a, there's actually a five minute, ten minute cartoon that's based on the book so you can watch that, just search under our iceberg is melting and I think you can still get the book. I would say it's one of the best books I've ever read to help me understand people. So in the book it defines the different roles that people take, being leaders, questioners, but there is one person who completely ignores all the evidence and says this isn't this isn't me, I'm not moving. And they eventually leave him behind. So they say they can't convert him, he will not move. This so they leave this penguin on the melting iceberg. We don't actually know what happened to him, but we know he got left on the on the melting iceberg when everybody else moved on and and the and the colony grew and grew and grew and grew in its new environment. But actually this one person couldn't change. And I think that's one thing that I have learned is that if there will be people in process changes that you do where they will not move and you need to find ways of, of shifting them out. I'm not suggesting you sack them but you need to find other opportunities for them uh, because they'll not change and you know people have to change in the end. There's only so much time you can spend. So be very conscious of that but if you get a chance, watch the video. It, it's, it's quite entertaining. Um, and finally, I said I'd cover off the, the communication plans. Well, as you can see, it's a very complex communication plan. Uh, on the left-hand side here, we have all the different roles that need to be educated. And one of the key things here is they're not all test roles, because actually everything we do in testing has an impact on somebody else. So we need to make sure all those other roles know what's going on. At the very top, we've got sort of senior management. We've got the testers. We've got pr project managers. We've got the methodology people. We've got all of the organization. And, and in principle, what we're doing is, in this picture you can see, this communication runs from July to December 2014. And as we get closer to January, which is the launch date, you can see the amount of blobs of different sorts of communication that goes on gets more intense. So you're building up and building up and building up. So in principle, you need to develop one of these where you can actually start to look at this stuff. So yeah, I appreciate this is not that clear to read, but you've got things like the green is a magazine that we issued once every month to people. There's, for, for the senior managers, a single sheet that goes out regularly to update them on things. Um, there's brown bag sessions going on. There's lots of stuff happening to start and, and help the communication cycle work better. So you need a communication plan. I talked earlier on about high level integration, but when we talk about, as I said, in there other parts of the organization, you need to understand which other parts of your organization do have some impact or are impacted. So on this diagram here, you can see those in red are the things that are directly impacted, that, that we've defined as directly impacted. Those in blue have, a, have an indirect impact. So sourcing, for example, you might need to go to them to find a vendor, you might need to go to them to find resources. Yeah, lots of different things. So you need to think about all these different structures that sit around you and who you who you would link with to actually make this thing work. So that's looked at process. That's looked at where we are today. And I said we'd finish the the presentation with a view with a with a uh, we've come a long way. We are a long way further forward than we were many years ago. And so let's let's look at that now. So we have four four hundred and fifty thousand testers, uh, up to four hundred fifty thousand testers certified by ISTQB, a ginormous number of testers worldwide. In a recent survey by ISTQB, three and a half thousand test resources saw process improvement as the way forward this year. Uh, within TMI, we have 29 certified organizations, nine of them at the highest level, level five. And of course, de our dear friend Eurostar has been going for 23 years, nearly 24, and it's getting bigger all the time. So there's still a lot of interest in testing. Now my company, Experimentus, run a yearly survey where we, we, uh, we have responses from over 250 people looking at levels two and three of, of TMI, the model you can see in front of you now. Within that 250, most IT sectors are actually IT sectors are actually represented as well. So it's a good cross section of the industry, looking at how effective people are at level two and three processes. So what was that? What, what was the result for, for this year, well, at the end of 2015? Well, we can see here 2015 in the blue and 2014 in the in the darker brown. So you can see not an awful lot of change. Not an awful lot of change. We kind of stood stood still. If I'd shown you, if I could include on this to 2012, you'll see we were a lot 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 weaker back in 2012. But now we're actually moving forward. But they're not not big steps at a time. So obviously training seems to become a big thing and we're now more integrated in the life cycle. But we've got a little bit weaker in test control and a little bit weaker in planning. So you know there are some things to pick up on. But in general, we're managing to maintain a level of maturity that is quite high, roughly 70% mature, which is, is, is quite high. If we look at specifics here, we look at uh, the telecoms industry uh, this year. The telecoms industry has traditionally been a very weak industry when it comes to quality. Uh, but this year, they've 
gone for it in a big way. Two of the largest uh, media companies have actually taken the journey to, to TMI Level 5, and I, I, you can find this on the TMI website, so I can't, I'm not telling you anything that you, don't, you won't be able to find out anyway. So that's Vodafone and Virgin Media did an excellent job of getting themselves to TMI Level 5, and have driven big change into their into industry. In fact, I was at a presentation only this morning from uh, Virgin Media showing how the move to a more efficient process has now allowed them to move to a more efficient automation process and lots of savings across the organization, millions of pounds worth of savings. I think 1,400 man days saved, so 14,000 man days saved, lots of time saved. So yeah, telecoms are suddenly in the last year uh, lit up as far as process was concerned. IT service providers kind of mimic the industry. Um, so they haven't really changed an awful lot, and they were the leaders in change. They were driving change for a few years, but uh, I question why that has changed. I, I, don't, I, I don't know the answer, but you know, actually, uh, what we what we do know is that the drive for IT service providers is all cost these days. And in fact, it was mentioned to me this morning in the same conference that you know, with IT service providers, quality is a given these days, um, and therefore people are challenging them on cost and time scales. So the challenge for an IT service provider now is to continue growing the quality with less income because the chart costs are going down. So actually, we're driving them to, to reduce their costs. We're driving them, uh, and, and there is the old phrase, you pay peanuts, uh, you get monkeys. I'm sure that's a bad example for an IT service provider, but we do need to think about the fact that you know, quality is not free, it is not a given, and people need to continually focus on it. So the next two slides give a different perspective looking at the different uh, process areas within um, uh, TMI level two and three, where you can see if I flick between them how um, there has been some movement, some backwards, but the vast majority going forwards. And what we're aiming for is to get as much as possible green, so heading towards the 90% being green, and that's slowly moving. So as an industry, we're doing okay, we're moving forward. Imagine we're a massive industry now, change takes time, so we're maturing as an industry, but there's still a long way to go before we can say we are a slick, a slick trim industry, uh, delivering good quality every time. So blatant advert now, um, anybody out there who would like to know how they are doing should go onto our website www.experimenters.com and t follow the link to create the benchmark survey. We will then send you back the results for your industry and your own so you can see how you're doing against your industry in general uh, and at the end of the year we'll provide you with a copy of the overall report that we produce that gives all the results. So please, please have a go, please have a go. So finally, uh, in summary, uh, as I said earlier on, process change is around 20% of the change, somewhere between 15 and 25. So it's the smallest part of the change. The people and culture are everything. Without them, this doesn't work. Remember Mr. Cotter's eight-step eight change process. Get that book. I'm not on commission, I promise you. Get that book. Have a look at it. See what it says. So the key success factors you can find in any project will be embedded in the people, the communication, how you communicate, and understanding how well you're integrated with other life cycle processes. Without that integration, how's a project manager ever going to know that you've got a new process coming along and it's going to impact him? You're going to give him a communicate to all those parties. And with that, I will close and say thank you for listening. Are there any questions? No, thank you very much for that presentation, Jeff. And um, as you just mentioned there, if you have any questions, guys, uh, please type them now if you haven't already done so. And before we take a look at those questions, I'm just going to go, go through one or two more slides here. And... Let me just bring to your attention as well another webinar we have taking place this week. Um, on Thursday, we have a webinar with Hans Buwalda, and he will be talking to you about how to get automated testing done. And right now, up until the end of the month, up until May 31st, you can get a 15% discount if you register for the Eurostar conference. So if you want to avail of this discount, just head over to Eurostar uh, website and you will see the program and you can avail of this great discount. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the questions that are coming in here. And I'll just open up my questions panel in front of me. The first question I have for you here, Jeff, and um, this this attendee is asking, uh, can you please elaborate on how TMMI is still relevant in agile DevOps world? 
Oh, thank you for that question. A <laughs> great, great question, and um, one we're often asked. Um, so, uh, for those who don't understand or know the detail of TMI, uh, it is not a process. It's a series of process components that uh, defines what is is should be included in a good process. Um, so it's as relevant for DevOps and Agile. In fact, 30 to 40 percent of all our TMI assessments are in the DevOps and Agile world today. Um, so, for example, uh, it will look for a components of a test plan. So it will look for something called a Gantt chart. That Gantt chart can be a document. Uh, 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 some flip charts, it could be uh, uh, on the wall with uh, post-it notes, um, it could be a document. Uh, it's looking for identification of metrics. Well, we all know burn-down charts there, they're all, uh, all those kind of things that exist for, for Agile projects and DevOps in the DevOps arena. So absolutely TMI complies. I think because it looks like a structured thing, People think, oh, that can't be agile. The reality is, as I said, you know, 30 to 40 percent of all the assessments we do these days are on agile projects, and they're very successful. Uh, it just needs knowledge of agile in the same way that you need knowledge of waterfall to map to, to judge a waterfall environment, uh, and you need to identify that all those. I think there's some in the region of 800 process components. We just need to identify where they are and how they're produced because they're no different. They're just delivered in a different way uh, in agile than they are in waterfall. And if they don't exist and they don't need to exist, then um, the, the, the uh, term my model allows exclusion. So um, yes, it's, it's as, as useful. I think hopefully that answers the question. It's a very quick answer. I uh, could probably do the whole presentation on, it, on its own. Another question here is asking, what can be done if test uh, processes have been implemented and followed for a period, period of time, but then slowly the processes fail through the cracks? or falls through the cracks, if I beg your pardon. <laughs> a bit of both, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, an interesting one. Um, so I think uh, the key thing uh, in the test, in the project that I referred to earlier on is how you're going to measure benefit. And, and the whole point of a, of a process improvement project ultimately is you, you produce an eternal cycle of change. So one would suggest that a process that starts to crumble is one that hasn't matured, you know, the organisation has moved on, people's knowledge has increased, but the process hasn't increased with it, so people start to avoid it, people, uh, uh, you yeah. know, and if you're not monitoring that process, if you're not tracking that process's use, then uh, that would be why it would fall down the cracks, that is my, is my perception. Um, so I think the key thing with a successful project of, of process, it sounds like one where the process has just been delivered and the project's been disbanded, yeah, once you've got strong process in place, CMI, TMI, whatever type of process it is, you need to have that ongoing management, be it light touch, however you do it, so that you can actually keep an eye on the process to make sure that if it's changing, it changes for the right reasons uh, and you're controlling that and it's rolled out and everybody understands it. As, as I say, as your organisation matures, for example, a lot of organisations struggle with risk-based testing initially. Once they understand it, they can do it and it becomes second nature and if the process doesn't move with their level of capability, then they'll get bored with it and they'll ignore it and they'll move on and do something different or they'll create their own version of it. So you need to keep your eye on process the whole time. It, it isn't a one-time hit. That's all I can say, and that's not easy to sell, I understand that, um, but the benefits uh, can easily be demonstrated by looking at companies that do it today, uh, and I haven't got time today, but there are lots of companies out there that successfully have ongoing process change all the time, um, and uh, even talk at conference, so come to conference, see people who talk about these things. Another question here is asking, um, so do you think TMMI should provide an updated framework with agile aspects mapped to TMMI processes? Now, there's another interesting question. I didn't expect this to become a TMMI presentation, but I, best, I guess I use TMMI in my examples. Um, I think there is a cultural thing, and I'm probably going to upset a few people now by saying that I think it's a cultural thing that if you don't use the right terminology, agileists say that's nothing to do with us. Uh, and I think that that's probably very valid in, in a certain world. If you live with a certain set of terminology and uh, my documents don't use that terminology, you ignore me. Um, so actually, it, it's a truism, and therefore is uh, the, 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 the TMI model doesn't currently include agile um, agile terminology. How However, however, there is an act, uh, some activity ongoing at the moment, uh, and if you're interested in helping, by all means go to the TMI website and register your interest to look at how the model can uh, look more agile uh, and feel more agile for those that absolutely want it to say the word agile rather than be the word agile. I would 
say that there is nothing in the model that says it's waterfall either. Uh, it's just that agile people like to see agile mentioned. So, um, so that sounds a bit bitter. I don't mean it that way, but um, it, it's just how we are in the agile world. If you don't use burn down charts and you don't use that phrase, however you might, whatever else you might call them, people ignore. So there is that challenge in the industry today, and the foundation is trying to rise to it, and they're trying to build a team of people together that can look at what could be done, might be done, to make the model, um, should we say, more un more understandable by our agile colleagues. Uh, the next question I have here, well, it's actually more of a comment just to, to get your views on it. Um, this attendee is saying, I guess there that there would be a different ideal benchmark measurements for different development methodologies. Have you any thoughts on that? Um, I think there are lots of different ways you can benchmark your process. I wouldn't suggest, well, the, the, it, and it depends how you do this. So there are models out there that are very agile or there are models out there that are very waterfall, um, Yeah, however way you look at it. So no, I, I don't agree they have to be different. They could be exactly the same because it's it's whether you're mapping against a predetermined process or whether you're mapping against some process components. And again, it's hard to explain on, on, this, on this webinar without a few slides, but in principle, TMMI includes process components. It has no process embedded in it whatsoever. So if we take, for example, the TMAP methodology, which is used for TPI, processing, uh, that actually now has a whole load of templates and a whole process around it. So you can just pick up, therefore, you can only measure against that if you're using the same principle methodology. But with TMI, method, it's methodology agnostic, so no, you wouldn't need to. If you're mapping against a waterfall process, yes, absolutely, if you suddenly got an agile process, you couldn't map that against the waterfall process, so you would use a different oracle. Uh, but in my mind, and why we support TMI is that because that becomes, that is the central oracle, that is um, the process oracle of all the different process steps that exist. So. All right, we're, we're nearly out of time here, so we're, we'll take one more question here, Jeff. And this question here um, is saying, uh, uh, the, the question that's come in is asking, um, my test team is currently not going through a process change. However, what if we need to change in the test development process? How do we go about change? <laughs> so, so you need to find somebody who will support you. Um, that's a very, very good question. I, I was trying to answer that before the question was asked actually in the presentation, so apologies if I failed to do that. But in principle, you need to plan. You need to find a sponsor. So um, if, if you see that something's changing and you need to change with it, you, you should go and talk to your manager. You should explain and help them understand why you need to change. If they don't understand and you can't explain it, then unfortunately, I'm sure, they will not support you and therefore you will not be able to change your process. But actually, often I do find, and we're often called in to help organizations, we went in to help, help an organization a few years ago, where actually the organization chose to change, to agile, in fact. And um, for some reason, nobody communicated that to the testing organization, or if they did, they didn't hear it. And the testing organization were left behind uh, and didn't change. And it wasn't until after the Agile process had been embedded that everybody realized testing hadn't been affected or been taken any notice of. And suddenly there was a major panic within the test team uh, and obviously they were needed help to change. Um, so yeah, it depends on the drive, but certainly uh, any process change uh, across your organization would impact testing and vice versa. But if testing itself is weak, then you need to find a compelling event that would drive the need to actually do a change. Because if nobody sees the risks in your process today, there's no point, if, if the risk is high that your process will help a project fail, then there's an obvious reason to help you fix it. If the perceived risk is low to failure, then the, most people would suggest there's no need to change that process. So it's about understanding the benefits, it's about explaining the benefits of change, what will be the different, what, what will change after you've done the process change, what will get better, uh, are we improving speed to market, are we making testing cheaper, all those kind of things so that you can actually convince a stakeholder that to invest in the time you will need. The last thing you want is to do what I've seen happen so many times in, in these projects where process changes become a side of desk activity. So you work your standard sort of 14 hour day and then you're expected before you go home to spend two more hours doing process change and they never work. Uh, it takes too long, it costs too much, it doesn't, there's no consistency, support dies very quickly, you know, lots of things like that. So, so yeah, 
uh, get your business case sorted out, understand why the change is necessary. If it's just something you want to do and, and there is no benefit, then it's not worth fighting for. It really isn't. Um, if, there's, if you can justify the benefit, go for it. Go and talk to your stakeholder and convince them it's the right thing to do. Okay. Um, I know I said that we'd take one last question, but there's so many here, I might take one final last question, if that's okay with you, Jeff. Um, it's fine. The, this question here is asking, how can we measure the gains of process change? So I guess there are, there are indirect and direct benefits. There, there are qualitative and quantitative benefits that you need to think about. So direct benefits may well be you know, savings. So for example, if you can deliver testing in a shorter time period, you're not only releasing the testers earlier, therefore there's a financial saving. You're re releasing all the developers who would have been sitting there waiting to fix things. Financial benefit. Um, so a very direct benefit. There's an indirect benefit or, or a qualitative type benefit where you, you're looking around um, things like uh, or your staff being more motivated and controlled. Uh, yeah, so you need to look at those them at the start of your project. Started. So if currently testing, let's assume testing costs £100 a month, I can say 10%, you know, what you then need to have is the metrics established that show that 10% saving in the first however long you think it would take. So for example, a retailer uh, a few years ago did a TMI exercise, changed all their processes and defined that they would reduce they would reduce the cost of development by changing the test process by 12% and that would filter through within 12 months. So they developed the metrics to measure the performance of testing to show that it reduced the overall cost of development by 12%. So there's no clear, there's no easy here's some metrics, go use them. You need to understand what your goal is. You need to define your goal, what your direct and indirect benefits are and then you need to record where you are at the start and then have a process whereby you collect data to measure how that changes over time. I can't mean, there isn't, there isn't, a, you know, people often ask, uh, is there a whole set of data we can just use? Well, no, because everybody's objectives for process change will be different and it's that objective that defines your measurement criteria. Okay, uh, that's all we've time for, for today. Um, another question that had come up quite a bit there was, um, a lot of people were asking, is this being recorded? Um, the answer is yes, we record all of our webinars. And if you want to access them, just head over to Test Huddle. And if you go to the Resource tab, you can check out all of our on-demand webinars. Right now, we, we have up there as well our most recent webinar, which took place yesterday with Kevin Harris of New Boys Media, where he, did, he discussed uh, striving for zero bugs on the test environment. And this webinar today, this one, Jeff's webinar, will be added very shortly. So you can check that out as well as register for more upcoming webinars. Um, thank you very much, Jeff, for taking time out today for that presentation. And um, thank you to all of our attendees today and all of your questions. We really appreciate it. That's all we have time for. So take care, everybody, and we'll see you all again soon. Thanks, everyone.